I'm up Freen's Court in Herefordshire, near the border between England and Wales. In 1990, an aerial photographer took this picture of a field in the valley down there. Look at these incredible parch marks. But what got the locals really excited was that 1,200 years ago, this whole area was ruled by Offa, the greatest king in Britain. He gave his name to Offa's Dyke, which was built to keep the Welsh out of his ancient kingdom of Mercia, and he was rumoured to have a palace near here. So could this be the remains of Offa's palace? Time team have got just three days to find out. Why do we think that Offa might have had a palace here? Right, well, we're towards the end of the 8th century, three years before the end of Offa's reign, he's an old man. We know he comes to a royal ville or palace site in Herefordshire, yeah. in a place called Sutton. And Sutton's where we are now? Sutton yes. is where we are bet now, between Hereford and Leominster. This presumably is the field where they found these parch marks. Yeah, we've just come through that gate there and yeah. we're, we're wandering across into the middle. John? Have you managed to geophys anything here yet? Well, we've not, Tony, but the, the lab from English Heritage have, and they've got some superb results. I mean, I just wish they were ours. I mean, you can see here this multi-celled building. That's really this, that's clearly. This here, isn't it? Yeah. Well, if mm. this really is Offa's palace, it's a major site, isn't it? Well, we only know of about a dozen Anglo-Saxon palace sites. Offa was a major European king, so it would be an extremely important site. Uh, we've given it legal protection as a scheduled ancient monument for that reason. If it's legally protected, how do we work out where we're going to dig? Well, we've done a project design for English Heritage, and in that project design we propose to put a trench over where people are standing over here. So that building that they're standing at is that one there. That's right, with these post pads. The parch mark dots on the aerial photograph are the remains of a second building. Keith believes they mark the stone foundations of a huge aisled hall. And then the building over this way is oriented north-south, and so there's a sort of east wall and the west wall. And what we've decided to do is try and put a trench in on the back wall of that, the west wall of is that. Is this what you've been calling the multi-celled building? That's what we've been calling the multi-celled yeah. building, because you can see at least three mm. separate parts of it. And then we've also suggested putting a trench over along the line of this bank here, which we think subdivides a larger enclosure. We, we ought to get on with it, haven't we? So. The geophysics results may look great. You can't ask for a better plot than that, can you? But there's a problem with them. The survey was carried out eight years ago, and since then, the grid reference for it's been lost. Until we can re-establish the exact position of the geophysics, we can't dig. There's the buildings traced off. That's the multi-cell building. This is the In the incident room, Bernard's trying to figure out the answer. So you can see we've traced all the archaeology oh, off. There's the building um, the and the position of the trenches. That's right. So I can. If the parch mark dots can be transposed from the aerial photograph onto a modern map, we can put our trench on the geophysics and get started. But fixing the correct position could take a while. Okay, could use that really good. Our problem trench is the one we want to put into our so-called aisled building where we want to locate and uncover the source of two of the parch mark dots. Everyone's being roped into the hunt. So where are we going to go then? In case Bernard can't sort it out, geophysics are also trying to help. But they're not having much luck either. Part of our problem, John, is that with this grass being wet, we're getting some uh, funny readings just as we put it into the... In the ground. Well, you can't you can't keep prodding about here all morning. We got we got to make well, a decision. Got to, we, we, have, we, have, we have two choices. One is we put on a grid and we properly take some measurements, and in 20 minutes' time we can tell you exactly where to go. Otherwise, we simply just say right, the grid we've put in is a, is approximately right based, based on, on the, re, the the earlier results. Yeah. And you just simply go with the the best fit, and you can do that now. It's already halfway through the first morning, and our only trench is the one across the earthwork bank. But there's a problem here as well. Because this is an ancient monument, we're not allowed to use machines. The turf and topsoil have got to be lifted by hand, all 17 tonnes of it. 
Yeah, there, there he is. is. Yeah. That's, that's showing the sort of... On the site of the Isled yeah. building, yeah. Phil and Keith still haven't started the trench over the parch marked dots. So where is it, John? I think if you go four metres that, that way, way, four metres that way, and three, three metres that way, that way right, we'll be that. where? On a postpath. At last, after three frustrating hours, Phil can finally open the trench. Our English heritage inspector, Paul Stamper, is determined to keep it nice and tidy. I just hope we have more than a stripy lawn by the end of day three. We've also got going with a third trench over the multi-cell building, and Carenza's already uncovering remains, but proving their Saxon's going to be very hard. There's little dating evidence like coins or pottery from this period. But elsewhere in Britain, archaeologists have uncovered remains of Saxon buildings, which probably look like this. The question is, can we prove ours are the same? The plans of all these buildings have similarities, and Anglo-Saxon historian John Blair believes that's an important clue. Now, if we're looking for a building of, a, of, of the right sort of date, we might look at monastic building. There's what's probably a monastic hall at Northampton of about 800. Now, a palace of the same date could have looked very much like that. So it, it, we wouldn't necessarily expect something in timber, then? It, it could actually be in, in stone or have stone features? Well, it's clearly not impossible. I mean, we don't have any royal palaces of stone of this date, but a, a, an important palace of Offa, who knows? It's certainly not impossible at all. In the 8th century, Offa's Kingdom of Mercia was the biggest in Britain and dwarfed its neighbours. Offa even compared himself to Charlemagne, who ruled a huge chunk of mainland Europe at the same time. But Offa was also a ruthless operator, prepared to murder his fellow kings to stay in power. According to records from the 12th century, such a murder actually took place here, at the Palace of Sutton, in 794. The main character is in fact King Ethelbert of East Anglia. By about 1100, there was a very colourful legend that he came here to the Royal Palace of Sutton to marry Offa's daughter, but Offa let his wicked wife persuade him to murder Ethelbert, so he then became a martyr and was regarded as a saint later on. According to this legend, Offa had the body thrown into a marsh by the River Lug, which is where we are now. And the next thing that happens is that a miraculous column of light appears and marks where the body is hidden. And some local people find it, and they have a vision which tells them to dig it up and take it into Hereford and bury it. The story goes on to describe exactly where they crossed the river, the route they took towards Hereford, and even a strange incident at a place called Lower Lyde Farm. You've got a picture of the, the cart, this two ox cart with the body on it, trundling yeah. down this road. Yeah. And of course, remember that the head's detached from the body. Why? Well, because Offa chopped it off. Oh, fair enough. Yeah, so, so at this point, the head rolls off yeah. and it gets lost in the undergrowth. But then there's a miracle, as there always is in these stories, because a, a blind beggar comes along. Of course he does. Yes, and, and he trips over the head yeah. and immediately recovers his sight. So he understands it's a miracle and he rushes along down the track after the cart and catches up with it at the next village, Sheldwick. And then what happens? Well, then they take the body on to Hereford and it's buried there and that, according to the legend, that's the origins of Hereford. In the Isled building, Phil thinks he's found the source of the parchmarked dots. Maybe this is one of the foundation stones of the Saxon building we're hoping to find. Look at this! It's an absolutely enormous lump of rock. Look at it! Now, would this be what we've been calling the post pad? Well, it ought to be, look yeah. Look at that. It's still going. Yeah. Look, there it goes. We need to see how big look, it look is, really. Look, look, there it goes. Is it going in the bulk as well? Oh, ah, Get your fingers out of the way and leave it alone. I get in there. <laughs> yeah. Look at that. It, 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 it's still... Look, it's still... Hey, look at that. It still don't look big enough, Phil, really. Well, how much bigger... Look at that. How much bigger oh, do right. you want it? Is, it? is it still... What would it have been for, then? Well, it's to support a, a big post of the aisle. Imagine like a church with aisles down the side. Yeah. And the posts stand on stones so it, they don't press into the ground. You know, it's, so is this the kind of technique that the Anglo-Saxons tended to use when they were building their palaces? No, it isn't really. It's a bit of a worry, that. I mean, what they would have done would be to dig a big pit and put a big post in it you know, ram it, and that would support the roof. This is the sort of technique that comes along a bit later. But yeah. could it have been built 
within where an Anglo-Saxon ah, was. Yeah, because what we get on so many of these places is that the, the palace site goes on being used. I mean, at Cheddar, for example, it goes on right till the 13th century. So the last phase is a big uh, medieval halls, but the, the Anglo-Saxon ones are amongst them. So there might be something underneath. Mick thinks that what we've got so far is largely medieval, and with good reason. Okay, these maps are absolutely beautiful, aren't they? The Corinza has been looking at an 18th century estate map which shows the field we're digging. And next to it, a medieval manor house called Freen's Court. We'll have to identify any medieval buildings we find to eliminate them from our hunt for Anglo-Saxon remains. Out in the field, Stuart's been looking at the same area. Stuart! Talk about lumps and bumps! This must be heaven for an archaeological uh, surveyor. Sheer, sheer paradise. It makes a nice change to have lots to work with. And that there is a fantastic amount of information in the earthworks on this site. So, so what can you see that we've got so far? Well, at the moment, we're stood in a fish pond. This thing that's like a, a big stadium. That's it. This would have been wet. And if you run up that way, you'd be running yeah. up onto the bank round the edge. So and around here? The edge of the fish pond, that's it. Yeah. And you see beyond you, there's a channel. Down that here, dip. yeah. If you're in that channel... Yeah. The water channel will go that way, curve round the corner and head towards the moat that was round Freen's Court. The old manor house? That's right, yeah. If you went that way, you see that big flat area ahead of you? Yeah. That's a former lake. <laughs> it's too it's wet. wet. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> I mean, it, this whole thing is a complex of ornamental lakes and fish ponds, all to do with the manor house. It's a big manorial complex. What sort of period? I think we can be anywhere from about the 14th century right through to, to the 18th century. So have you seen anything here yet which seems to you Anglo-Saxon? Nothing. Nothing! <laughs> so much. <laughs> Everything goes this episode of Time Team. <laughs> <laughs> Everything looks classically medieval as it stands at the moment. I mean, the trench where we dig in just there, which was, th was thought to be a subdivision of this Saxon palace enclosure, yeah. um, that's the dam that holds back this lake here. Stuart doesn't know what might be underneath the earthworks, but he's right about the bank. The trench across it hasn't produced a single find. Our Saxon palace is assuming mythical proportions. On a Saxon site in Northampton, archaeologists recently discovered the remains of a 1,200-year-old machine for mixing building mortar. With the help of a sketch from Victor and two woodworking experts, Phil's going to try and build a working replica. Oh, I see. This is like an enormous food mixer. I mean, how does it actually work? Well, this part rotates and you can see the people are pushing it round and there's a series of paddles that run down into the lime and sand mix and stir it up underneath. So, what's this bit here? That's the central post. It's about a foot in diameter and we're making it out of this piece of wood over here. Right. With a spindle at the top. We've already started to reduce it whilst it was one whole log. We've seated the oh, cut All right. Like that. So that's going to taper in like that. Yeah. And then this bit is made out of this log here, which R I'm going to split in half. And we'll use the offcuts from the other half to make the paddles out of. And then you literally just push it round yeah, and round yeah. and round. So where are we going to put this thing? It's going to go over there. Oh, I see, round here. That's right. Yeah. We've got to do some wattle work to hold the mortar in, because this one's going to be set on the ground. Some were actually dug into the ground. I'm going to start with this small mallet just to get... The it first started. task is to split the log in half to make the rotating crossbeam. Richard's using just wooden wedges and a Saxon mallet to split the tree trunk along the grain of the wood. Have you got absolute control over which way this thing is going to split? Well, you've got to rely on the tree. If you, if you use wooden wedges, then they tend to run along the grain. Oh! Oh, look at that! And you can hear it. You still hear it too. Yeah, like duck quack. If they drive the wedges in too fast, there's a danger the log won't split cleanly down the middle. This isn't going to be a quick job. Well, this has come on a lot, hasn't it? It looks as if you've got tile and stuff in it. We found a lot of other roofing material oh, as well. Yeah, We've got a stone it? there. It's a stone one with the, yes. <laughs> with the um, hole in. There's bits of slate. In the trench yeah. over the multi-celled yeah. building, that's we've got some finds at last. Yeah. Even later. So I think what we've got is a lot of building rubble from several different phases of building. But I think that's spread across 
the wall underneath here and I think some of this is wall rubble right. and tomorrow Katie's just planning at the moment once that's done tomorrow probably we'll take all this loose stone off and hopefully find the wall underneath so right. that's the good news I mean what date do you think it is well that's the bad news yeah. <laughs> um, nearly all the finds we've had have been post medieval we've got everything from sort of you know bits of willow pattern plate yeah. certainly not Saxon palace yet then not yet not yet <laughs> <laughs> I'll cut across this bit if I. That's incredible. You can tell that's Look at that. Yes! Home. One half of this will become the rotating part of the mortar mixer. Tomorrow's big challenge will be to set up the other log as the centre post on which it'll turn. That was all right then, wasn't it? It went very well, yeah. Good, yeah. God. You look pleased as punch about this trench, what yeah. is it? I think it's a really nice piece of British archaeology. Very, very typical of what we find all over the country. But what is it that we can see? Well, we've got a laid surface here, running right the way across. It's possibly laid over rubble. Over here, one of those post pads that we were talking about. Possibly another one under the bulk back in there. And the could, this could be the fragmentary remains of another one in here. Yeah. And then we talked about this uh, being an aisle building. And outside it, we can see just the traces, this, possibly, this, of a wall this, coming this through here, into there. Yeah. Any idea of a period? Well, this is, this is rubble. Um, we've got no dating evidence so far. Um, it could be post-medieval even at, the, at this stage. Or medieval? Or medieval. Or Saxon? Well, that's the more difficult. Yeah. <laughs> how, how do we find out? Well, one way we can find out is by taking a, a quarter of the trench out tomorrow, yeah. going down through the surface into the underlying rubble, remove some of that and see if we've got post holes and that kind of feature. Stuart, when I last saw you, you said that you were going to try and work out the medieval landscape around the fish ponds. Mm -hmm. How have you done? I think we've had a certain amount of success, actually. What we seem to have is a series of fish ponds on that alignment, which are replaced by further yeah. ponds over here, this, this lake. The whole thing looks like a menorial, me medieval manorial complex yeah, to me, mate. with these fish ponds and gardens That's and all right. this and Something else interesting has emerged in that if you look at the 1720 map and 19th century Alden survey maps, we put yeah. the whole lot together yeah. and match these two up. If you can see just there, there's a building shown on that alignment oh, on the, yeah. just outside yeah, yeah. the moat ah. on the 1720 map. Yeah. It matches perfectly with that end of this parchment here. So it looks as though we know what the medieval landscape here was like, but the question is, was there anything here earlier? It's the beginning of day two. Yesterday, we found lots of evidence of a medieval manor house, but nothing even remotely like a Saxon palace. But while everyone else carries on from where they left off, Mick and Keith Ray suddenly decide to head off on a completely new tack. Mick's turned his attention to a small knoll, quarter of a mile from the main site. Yesterday we were excavating for Offa's palace down the bottom of that hill, which is what I thought we were going to continue to do today. But suddenly, lock, stock and barrel, we all seem to have moved into this potato field. What's going on? So we've got this aerial photograph with this uh, crop mark on it. So we always intended to come up and look at this. Yeah, I think that we really need to be looking at one or two other locations in the landscape. The question is, what are the clues for that? Now, this enclosure is one of those clues. It's quite unlike the Iron Age and Roman enclosures yeah, that we've got yeah. in this area. It's very elongated. So have we geophysed this area yet? Yeah, look at the results. Clear as anything. <laughs> I can't see anything at all. <laughs> you can just see the hints of maybe two ditches, in fact, and then returning at that point there. Yeah. So but how are we going to get at whatever's here? Well, I think we'll need to open up quite a big area. When you say quite a big area, how big? Uh, about 30 metres by 20 metres. 30 metres? could be one of the biggest areas we've ever dug, but it's the only way to get at these ephemeral features, really. Does this mean that actually we're jacking in the site down the bottom of the hill? Not at all, no. No, no. We, I mean, we've got a lot of cleaning and sorting out to do there before we go down into it. We should carry on down there. Meanwhile, we dig this 30-metre trench? Yeah, yeah. The enclosure on the knoll is over 300 metres away from our other trenches, but Keith thinks the settlement here might go back more than a 1,000 years. There's only one way to find out. Back on the main site, our trench across the earthwork bank has come up with nothing. Stuart was right. 
It had more to do with fish ponds than fortifications. Ian, is there any reason we shouldn't shut this trench down? Um, no, I think we've nearly finished. OK. You happy about that? Yeah, I am. I think uh, this has quite efficiently characterised what we've got here, particularly tying it in with what Stuart's discovering. Yeah. I mean, the lack of any medieval or earlier evidence in this trench is disappointing. But in the trench over the Isled Hall, things are looking more promising. Phil, you got something for me? Oh, I say we have, Tony. Have a look at this. Beautiful shirt, shirt of medieval joke. Look at the size of it. See? Look at those edges. Cool. Isn't that a marvellous piece? That's lovely. And the important thing is where it comes from. It comes from there by the label, 203, in yeah. that soil. Now then, look at these stones. Those stones go into the soil. So the soil is lapping up against it. So it looks as though the stones went in first, the soil is lapped up against them, and then the cobbles, which is what we're taking off, is again lapped up against these. These stones are protruding up through. So if these cobbles are post-medieval, post and this is underneath it, is underneath with this in, then this, this could well be medieval. medieval. Yeah. Oh, that's good, isn't it? Fragments of pottery may be our best chance of dating these buildings accurately. If there's one person who can tell us exactly when and where each piece was made, it's local pottery expert Alan Vince. Okay. Ah, uh, this one. That is actually slightly earlier than uh, the ones we've just been looking at, and that's from the Malvern Chase. Now, <laughs> looking at that, <laughs> how can you possibly tell that that's from the Malvern uh, Chase? Well, uh, there's a little white grit there, and there's a much bigger one there. Let's see if we can look it under the microscope. That's granite, and you don't get granite anywhere in this part of the world except along the central spine of the Malverns. And do we know that there was a pottery there? Yes, yes, it's uh, well documented up until the uh, 1620s and after that uh, the chase that supplied the fuel uh, was enclosed and they couldn't use the, uh, the wood anymore and so the pottery just folded. What about the medieval piece that Phil was so excited about? Right you are then, okay. Well, it's a jug which is a standard medieval form. Uh, it's thrown on a wheel and in this part of the world, that means it's at least the middle of the 13th century or later. And it's got quite a lot of sand in it, but it doesn't look like it's quartz. We'll have a look, see what we can tell. Ah! That's the sandstone sand, and there's only one place you get that around here, and that's the Lug Valley, which is just up the road. So this is a locally made medieval pot, and I would say it probably dates to the end of the 13th or 14th century. The medieval jug would have looked like this. In our trench over the multi-celled building, Carenza's making pretty good progress too. Hi Carenza. Oh, hi Paul. You've got a wall. Yes, isn't it lovely? It's very nice indeed. We're really pleased about that because <laughs> When we came here this morning, all we had was this rubble spread all over the place. It didn't really look like anything. We started to take it. it down and it still didn't look like anything. We've only just come up with this line, comes along here. And I mean, it's, it's very big, it's well built. That, that's all one stone it's there. It's massive, it's 50 uh, centimetres or so yes, across. Yes, at least half a metre. But to get a conclusive date for the building, Carenza needs to find the bottom of the wall and next to it, some dating evidence. To make it easier to work, if you do a series of little notches, in along like that first. Yesterday, Phil and our woodworkers Richard and Guy started making a Saxon machine for mixing mortar. They've already made the rotating cross beam. Now Richard's carving a spindle on one end of the centre post to support it. This is a, a mid-Saxon T-axe. This is the kind of axe they use for hewing flat surfaces on wood. And they use a much narrower bladed axe for felling trees. He's got to shape it into a perfect cylinder so the crossbeam will spin smoothly on top. Once the centre post is in place, they'll build a wattle fence around it to hold the mortar. Back 
back on the knoll, our 20 by 30 metre trench has started off as a more modest 20 by 5 metres. But we think we found part of a double ditch geophysics spotted earlier. We've got another ditch running through, which we'll hope to find when we actually extend the trench. Jules is in here now, trying to find the edges of that ditch. Well, it looks in, in the section face here as if there's some indication of the cuts of the archaeological features. They're really quite shallow, but you can see them coming along here and down here. The archaeology here is fragile and we risk damaging it. But Paul and Mick the Dig decide to extend the trench in the hope of finding evidence to date this settlement. See you on. See, this looks a much smaller church. Mick and Anglo-Saxon historian John Blair are also widening the search to include the local parish church. We know from historical documents that in 794, King Ethelbert of Kent was murdered at Sutton by offer. Ethelbert later became a saint, which is why John and Mick are looking here for Saxon remains. Ah, it's right, a great that big, be, It's a great big 13th century arch, and it's coming westwards out of the nose. So is it coming into a tower? Well, it could be a tower, but there's no sign of that. I just wonder whether it could be a further western compartment. Well, in which case, it would go this way, wouldn't it, and would end up it coming through a, into this field. It would make a much bigger church. Well, there's a lot of earthworks in here, look. There are, and it looks to me as though there's a kind of bank coming across there. The best way to examine the earthworks thoroughly will be from the air. In the late afternoon light, the medieval features at Freen's Court are clearly visible. Oh, you can see the, the fish ponds and the island. The darker green is where the water was. Yeah. And the, the, the bits in between are raised islands and walkways, part of gardens and, and allowing them to maintain the fish ponds. You can see this is, is a really nice piece of medieval water management. Less than half a mile from Freen's Court is Sutton Church, where Mick and John Blair spotted the earthworks earlier. You know, it's a typical little medieval church, really, probably Norman. And this ground is actually quite high yeah. and close to the river. It'd be dry, it wouldn't flood. And I think that's the kind of ground that the, the Saxon palace would have been placed on. Well, certainly these areas of earthworks around it are a possibility. I, mean, right. I think if we get time, we should go and look at that. I, I think we ought to. So in, in this field here, yeah, yeah. you see that big ditch going right yeah. down towards the river? And at this end of it, just adjacent to the churchyard, is a raised platform. Now, I, I just wonder if this is the sort of clues we might that might give away where there might be a possible Saxon yeah, palace. Yeah. The size of the ditch and platform suggests this was once a substantial settlement, but we'll have to wait till tomorrow to investigate. On the ground, our search is expanding further. Just below the trench on the knoll, geophysics are surveying the field where Freen's Court Manor House once stood. Maybe this was the site of Offa's Palace. And our Saxon mortar mixers starting to take shape. Phil and Guy are making the wattle fence around the centre post. That's that one then. Eventually, this will form a giant basket to hold the mortar. Ah. Meanwhile, Richard's working on the rotating cross beam. Richard, what are you doing? We've already got one hole in there. Well, we're making the holes for the paddles to go in. Oh! If you remember, that's the hole for the central spindle. Right. And we've got this plan oh, here. Oh, of course. The central hole here, the circular central hole for the pivot. And so, then we've got these holes yeah, on we're, the we're, So that's what we, where they go right the way through? Yeah. It's probably a post hole for something. Rotten stone or more. Carenza! Yeah. Oh, hi there. God, this has come on a lot since yesterday. We seem to be messing with 19th century cobbles then. Yeah, well, the 19th century cobbles are still there. Yeah. The 18th century possibly. But I mean, this is good, isn't it? Yeah, it's fantastic, isn't it? And this morning it looked, well, this morning the trench looked like that side of it yeah. still does. Yeah. And um, we found, first of all, we found that side of the wall and then this side. And this is fantastic. We've got three courses of it as well. And it looks as almost as if we've, we've got a. A narrow course there, and then a much wider course here, yeah. and then possibly another narrow one down there, which is and nicely made. And have you got any idea of date or how it fits in at all? Well, most of the material that's come out is 18th, 19th century landscape engineering to level the site flat. And I don't envy the person who did the work, because it's been a hell of a job yeah. digging it out. So do you think you're going to be able to get down to that early layer there then, Chris? It looks very hopeful. I mean, the, the material that we're 
just coming down to seems to be a, a fairly flat surface. Yeah. With charcoal in it, burnt grain. We found a small piece of grain. Like. Um, so I think tomorrow morning when we come back and we'll get this cleaned up and we should be able to see the, the floor surface and it already looks as though we've got we a, might a post hole perhaps there. Dug what, around the, oh yes, I see, see that. Yeah, it's so very reddish, colour, yeah. Yeah. reddish clay here and then gravel yeah. in the middle and it's very different to the different yes, to the yes. sort of um, ochre coloured clay that we've got at the edge here. Well, that's all very encouraging. You better carry on because we've got very limited light, haven't we? We weren't we... going to stop. You've interrupted us. Well, no, I'm, us. I'm interrupting you now, but yeah, I'll okay. catch up with you in the morning. All right. Yep. So where have you been all day? Well, I've been looking at churches and flying in the helicopter. So you've no idea what's happening well, in our wonderful trench? Yeah, I mean, there's another post pad here, look, from well, the big timber. that's popped out of nowhere, isn't it? Underneath all the, the rubble and so on. And then all this area's been cleaned, and Phil's got some fantastic stuff out of this hole, haven't you? We are really... Really chuffed, Tony. We, we've actually pushed the story back in this trench, what, several hundred years. Out of that hole, we've got pottery 1150 to 1200. Excellent. And we're getting pieces of masonry. This is high status stuff. This is not farmyard stuff. It might even be part of a window surround. And that's come out of here as well. And then from up on the top of the hill there... Yeah, we've uh, got we've a this, piece of um, 11th century pottery. This is sort of ah. time of the Norman conquest from, from that trench up on the top. Excellent. It's the third day of our hunt for Offa's palace, and we've yet to find a single piece of Saxon evidence. But we've got the new geophysics results from Freen's court, Stuart wants to examine the earthworks behind Sutton Church. There are lots of options, but little time. So Mick's going to have to choose. Yeah. What you got there, Chris? Well, this is the magnetic response from Freen's court. In fact, we've got an absolute wealth of archaeology in there. It's stuffed. So can we dig there? Uh, no, I'm afraid you can't. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Well, that's pretty definite, wasn't it? <laughs> it's within the scheduled area, and so not without prior permission. So does that mean we're just going to be able to work on the parts of Freen's Court we've already been in? Well, we're going to carry on there, but we've got another option just up the road where the church is, where Stuart and I saw these fantastic earthworks from the air yesterday. So we think we might have a look at that. Just to orient you, there's Freen's Court there. You can see the earthworks. That's the Iron Age hill fort on top of the hill and the church is just there. Now what we saw from the air is a large ditch coming down here and also a big high platform here. I'm not saying it is an Anglo-Saxon palace, what I'm saying is we've got a complex of earthworks here which I think we ought to examine in the context of looking for mm. the Saxon palace. Mm -hmm. Keith, we've only got one day left. Do you really think this is where we should be putting our resources or isn't it wandering rather aimlessly around the country. No, so. no, 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 not at all, Tony. In fact, quite the opposite. And what Stuart has done is identify this enclosure, which may indeed be another Saxon site. And in fact, what we really are opening up here is a potentially a landscape of sites. And we really need to try and take a look at that as, as quickly as we can. So what exactly is it that you want us to do? Well, I think we should start by geophysic that area, uh, with a view perhaps to digging a machine cut trench across the big ditch at the side of the site. A trench, Paul? Can we dig a trench there? No problem with that. You're well clear of the scheduled area. So it's geophysic? Yeah, can we, can we get Did on with that? Did you hear that, then, Chris? Uh, what, today? No. Come on, we've got one day left. <laughs> Let's get on with it. <laughs> On the main site, the work goes on. In the trench across the aisle building, Phil's still digging the pit where yesterday he found a piece of 12th century pottery. On the knoll, we've opened a series of smaller test pits inside our giant trench. One of these has produced our earliest fragment of pottery so far from an 11th century bowl. But before we can investigate the field behind Sutton Church, we need permission from the owner. I think so, yeah. yeah. Hello. Mrs Harper? Yes. Uh, am I right in saying that you own that field out there? Yes, I do. We're from the time team. Oh. And uh, we were wondering whether we might put a trench in. Well, we've always known there's been some medieval uh, interest down in that field, and we're not allowed to develop it, so if you can go and find out for us what's going on there, very good. I would be interested. <laughs> we'll come back and tell you. Oh, yeah, well, certainly. Would that yeah, be all right? Absolutely delighted. Thank yes, you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Thank you. Next to the church, geophysics survey the platform. But we open up a new trench straight away across the boundary ditch nearby. The ditch may be another medieval feature, but it could be a lot older. We'll see. 
Back at Freen's court, Carenza's finally got some dating evidence for the multi-celled building. We are starting to make just a little bit of progress on that at last. Um, we uh, have gone down, well, we've gone down both sides of the wall here, and as you can yeah. see, it's showing up quite nicely. It's still going to go down further because these clay layers here are still butting up against it. There's no foundation cut for that wall visible this yet. This is where we looked last night. Along That's this, right, yeah. yes. And then one of these floors, when we cleared, cleared it down from just about down here, stuck between two of the brick, the stone courses in this wall, yeah. we have found a piece of pottery. Oh, right. which Alan Vince has had a look at and dated to the early 12th century. Oh, right. Well, so we're, we're looking at something around about 1100 then. That's right, yeah. The wall must have been built before the floor in which we found the bit of pottery was laid. A date for the pot would therefore tell us the latest construction date for the building. That's if our pottery expert Alan Vince can identify one of the sherds. Right. So Got that, anything else? Yes. Well, it's this bit as well, which is rather oh, wow. nice. Is that right. a rim sherd there? Yeah. Now, this is more like it. This, we can do something with this. Oh, right. Um, just so happened to have my book with me. <laughs> and number two. Number two there is precisely what you've got. And that dates to the early years of the 12th century. They've recently had an excavation at Hereford Cathedral and there they were turning up in a group of about 1103. Oh, wow. Yeah. Gosh. Very so it looks as if our building went up before 1103. That's tantalisingly close to the end of the Saxon period in 1066. John Gator's got the geophysics results from the field behind Sutton Church. Yes. Is it good? <laughs> well, look at this. This is the resistance plot. Black is walls, rubble, high or resistance. whatever, mm. high resistance. Or buildings mm. or something like that. So, I mean, it looks like a nice mm. building there. I mean, cool. when you actually process the data a bit more, have we got some sort of courtyard? It's not entirely surprising there are structures here. The key thing, of course, is going to be what date they are. Well, we'll only uh, know that if we decide in the remaining time we've got to put something in this and have a look, yeah. which would at least tell us perhaps the condition of what's here and more importantly the date of it. Perhaps yeah. we just put in a four by two. With half a day to go, yeah. we're opening our sixth enclosure. trench. An so enclosure this yes. side. All right, you left in our grunt. That sounds good. All right. Phil and our Saxon woodworkers Guy and Richard have completed the wattle lined pit for our Saxon mortar mixer. It's time to fit the crossbeam. Uh, to you, uh, that, that's it, lovely job. Excellent. Oh, look at that. Fits. I'm impressed. It's good, isn't it? Oh, excellent. I mean, is that going to need lubrication? Well, we're going to try it without first, but I've got some mutton fat if we do need lubrication. The final stage is making the paddles to stir the mortar. Cool. Yeah, well, there's these yeah, nice and taut. Is that, uh, is that big piece of pottery going to come out? Yeah. In our trench over the aisled building, we've hit a layer of burnt material, including more fragments of pottery. Sieving this charcoal has revealed burnt seeds and cereal grains, which we can send off for radiocarbon dating. Our trench on the knoll hasn't produced any more pottery, so we shut it down. But from our earlier finds, we know there was a settlement here nearly a thousand years ago. In Carenza's trench, the piece of pottery from 1103 has prompted a radical rethink about the age of the multi-celled building. And we, when we started, if you remember, we'd got two basic models for a building of this shape, the cellular structure. One was Middle Saxon, Royal Palace yeah. in stone. Um, the other was perhaps 12th, 13th century manorial complex. Well, now that we've got clear dating for this wall, and that is that it's earlier than 1100, it means the medieval option, the manorial complex, disappears. But Chris, just because it's earlier than 1100, why does it have to be as early as mid saxon Oh, it doesn't have to be. But I mean, that's that the one model we've got is a, is a building of similar shape a yeah. large hall in Northampton, which has been excavated, and that is an 8th century Mercian um, large, power powerful person's hall. Yeah, it's either a um, royal site or, or a monastery, isn't it? That so basically, we haven't got anything that looks like this between the 8th, 9th century and the early Middle Ages? That's correct. 
apart from churches. So does that mean that we can say that this wall is Anglo-Saxon? Well, no. Well, why not? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, I, I, I think that with the evidence we've got now, we can be... The highest probability is that this is a Saxon wall. That's but right. what we'd really ideally like to find to prove it beyond any doubt is the foundation trench that was dug when this wall was built and at the bottom of it to find a lovely bit of Anglo-Saxon pottery or metalwork to be absolutely certain. Next to Sutton Church, the two trenches we opened this morning have produced mixed results. So how is this trench going? Because, to be quite honest, I can't see anything in it. <laughs> The trench on the platform revealed traces of the foundations of timber buildings, but we've no idea what date they are. We're going to leave you with a conundrum here that you've got to come back to at some stage. Yeah, it's certainly a puzzle. I mean, these, these yeah. ditches are probably defining areas where there might have been yeah. buildings, but at what date, we just don't know as yet. But the trench across the enclosure ditch has shown that the original earthworks were much bigger than we'd imagined. Gosh, that's enormous. I mean, I'm, where I'm saying it at the moment, it's from here beyond the digger. That's, that's right. Incredible, yeah, incredible, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, we can just see traces of an outer bank probably there. And there in the centre, where their shoveling is, mm -hmm. is the middle of the ditch, we've had to cut it to this step right. uh, plan for safety reasons. I mean, a, a ditch of this size is something you'd imagine with a big palace site, something enormous, yeah. isn't it? High status. Yeah, yes. It certainly is, it is really the size of a town ditch. And it's very interesting that Offa is the first king to be associated clearly with planned towns, with defences including, in fact, Hereford. So this is very much like the sorts of ditches that Offa's towns have. The size of the area bounded by the ditch also suggests it was once a substantial settlement, and we've got some finds from it. There's a certain amount of bone and a few iron objects, mainly large nails. That's actually quite interesting because if this were an Anglo-Saxon feature, that's exactly the sort of group one might expect, oh, since they weren't using pottery very much at all in this area. So mm -hmm. it could be that this is our one real major Saxon feature. Wow, that's exciting, <laughs> yes. isn't it? We did find one interesting find. Oh. Uh, this was right from the bottom of the ditch. It's, it's not been cleaned yet, and we're not quite clear what it is. Mm -hmm. The guess I'm making on the spur of the moment is that it's a miniature anvil, right. possibly from a metal workers set for fitting into a bench. I see. The anvil would have been used for delicate metal working. Sadly, there's no way of telling when it was made. Well, shall we uh, yep, I'm try ready the big experiment? What You'd do I like do? to go that end, Tony, and push that way. Yeah. I'll push the other way. Has anyone ever done this experiment before? No one has ever, as far as we know, tried this experiment before. <laughs> so <laughs> this is a world first the, since the, about the year 900. Exactly. <laughs> right. So I'm going to okay, shove... If you shovel the sand in, we right. we'll start turning. And I'm going to add some lime. Not madly convinced by the lime in the plastic buckets. Well, it is the traditional unslaked lime. Oh, so it's really the kind they'd have used? Yeah. Well, it's certainly pushing it about, isn't it? Yes. Well, that's right. And, and I mean, if you can use it and if it works, I mean, it's going to be such a labour-saving device, isn't it? I think it's mixing it. Go ahead. Let's stop and have a look. <laughs> it is definitely mixing it. It's look, working. look at this sand in here at the button near the thing. Look, that is unmixed sand. Yeah, it's, it's very red. Well, it's not working there. But, yeah, but look at that. Look at that white stuff in it. Yeah, that is the mixed up. You can feel it. Look. Oh, uh, look, that's pretty look, good. It, it, look, it, it's, it's, look, it glues together. Look. Yeah, yeah. Look. That's not mixed, is it? No. 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 What about this? That's mixed. Mixed? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. 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 Gonna come and help? Yeah. Come on, come on, all of you, get stuck <laughs> in. Right, half of you on that end. You're on then. Right. Okay, and he. <laughs> Drop an egg in there. You'd have a big Christmas cake. <laughs> it's exactly it. Oh, it's getting really stiff now. <laughs> You're doing well. Another twenty laps to do. <laughs> It's getting near the end of day three. I'll leave them there. <laughs> At the very end of day three, the trench across the post pad building revealed the charred remains of a wooden floor at one end. Radiocarbon dating confirmed it was nearly a thousand years old, similar in age to the pottery we found inside it. But it was Bernard who produced the biggest shock. 
He carried on checking the position of the geophysics for the parch mark dots until late on day three, when he concluded that the parch marks hadn't been made by the stones that Phil uncovered after all. Pits there, lump, big lumps of stone under the you may remember on day one, we had difficulty fixing the trench over two of the dots on the aerial photograph. So where are we going to go then? Well, it seems that although we were close, the trench didn't go quite where we'd intended. Phil quickly found a large stone which he assumed was a post pad and the source of one of the parch marks. But Mick wasn't sure. Look at that. It still don't look big enough, Phil, really. Well, how much bigger? Look at that. I, I would have expected something about twice the size of that. Twice the size? Yeah. Mick was worried that this method of construction wasn't Saxon. I think all the buildings we know of that, that have been said to be Saxon palaces are actually the, 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 the timbers go into big post pits, big sockets in the ground. This sort of idea doesn't come along until later. In the last hour of digging, Bernard proves that the parch marks had been made by collections of much larger stones piled into much bigger post holes, just as Mick had suggested. Originally, these holes were giant sockets for timber uprights, sunk two metres into the ground. Unlike the post pads, this method of construction is typical of Saxon buildings. We can't be sure how they looked, but we do know that all the buildings here were constructed on a grand scale, and that many of them were in use at roughly the same time. So, it seems to us we've definitely got a very strong candidate for Offa's Palace, which is a fantastic start for archaeologists in the future, who hopefully one day will be able to prove it. Over on Civilization Next, the ghost hunters search for spooks. Here on Discovery Channel Next, though, we enter the chaotic world of the Monster Garage.